Okay, this morning's scripture reading comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, 23 through 25. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Good morning. Good morning. Man, I didn't tuck my wire. See, you're supposed to not know that there's a sound around me. I brought Franklin today. Do you see Franklin? So Franklin is a... Really? Y'all don't even know that much. We're going to have a big problem today. This is a basketball. Okay. That was the easy part. Um, so it says it's the official size, official weight. Um, everything checks out. It has those little lines. I don't know what they do, but every basketball has to have them or else it's not real. It's just a volleyball, I think. So I've checked it out, made sure everything was correct, and it goes according to plan, and it bounces great. It's, it's just, see? Um, uh, I'm having a little problem with my bouncy ball. Um, but there's nothing wrong with my bouncy ball. So today we're going to ask a question, do we ask the right question? If I ask if this is a ball, is it, you know, matched to standards, does it have all them goofy lines, does it everything work out? The answer is, okay, this is yes, this is no, okay, wow, rough day, rough day, okay. So is this a basketball? Yes. See, y'all are getting this, it's not really that hard. But it doesn't bounce. And there's nothing wrong with the, bas the basketball. So today we're going to talk about speech that builds up. And sometimes we look at things and we get the wrong answer. Right? I mean, have you ever gotten the wrong answer? None of us have taken tests. I got it. Okay. Very quiet today. Amazing. If we ask the wrong question, we get the wrong answer. If I ask if this is a basketball, if everything's there and everything is right, the answer is yes. And if I say, oh, it can't bounce because it's not a basketball. No, that doesn't make sense. Now, if I look at it and I ask the right question, I say, is that ball built up? You have to love when you mess up everything. No, okay, good. Don't worry, I'm just, I'm getting this, okay? I'm new to this too, don't worry. You notice how little I am that it picks me up, but okay. <laughs> now I look at this bouncy ball, basketball, sorry for offending all of y'all. Forgot what sport it was. Um, Franklin, you know, don't worry, Castaway taught me that. It bounces. I didn't change it. This is still the same basketball, but watch this, it bounces. I can't dribble, but we can pretend, right? Now the question is, when we come to church, we ask questions. And we want to know how our speech can be better. But so often we ask questions like, is this a bouncy ball? Does it have all the right lines? And we don't ask the question that this passage is going to repeat over and over. I want you to listen for one word, edify. Pump up, build up. Get it? Pump up, build up. We got the idea here. But what's going on is, I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We're going to start in verse 1, and we're looking for one word. It's repeated over and over and over. Because it tells us there is a more important question than, does everything in the right order, does everything fit in its little place? There's a bigger question. One that I wasn't considering until I realized that it needed more than just to be a basketball. We need more than just to have the right worship. We need to ask a secondary question. And the way we speak and the way we talk, we need to do this. 1 Corinthians 14, starting in verse 1. Pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts but especially that you may prophesy. 
For who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. But one who prophesies speaks to men for edification and exhortation and consolation. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. But one who prophesies edifies the church. Now, I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you would prophesy. And greater is the one who prophesies than the one who speaks in tongues unless he interprets so that the church may receive edifying. What's our word? I know. This is an interactive lesson. I apologize. Edify. That's our word. Build up. Right? And he doesn't come in and say, which is more spiritual? Because guess what? When we're dealing with tongues and prophecy, neither one is more spiritual. One technically could be considered more spiritual. It is between you and God. And that's tongues. It doesn't include anybody else. It doesn't edify anybody else. But it glorifies only one person. Only one understands. Has anybody thought I was talking about worship right now? I did. Because I have heard this for so long that our worship is one direction and do not even think about the people beside you. We, the worst phrase I've ever heard, we come to communion and we say, forget everything around you. This is how I was taught. I don't know if y'all were. And my problem was, Paul doesn't ask that question. He doesn't say, which is the more spiritual? Which is the most spiritual way to do things? He's actually concerned about something else going on in this assembly. Edification. But edification is not God. We don't edify God. We worship God. He doesn't look at this and say, let me put them out and say, tongues, you know, you get this level of worship. Okay, now prophecy, you get this level of worship. He says, tongues, the edification. Nobody's edified but you. And if we don't even ask the question, we're going to get the wrong answer every time. If I ask if this is a basketball and you keep telling me yes and I keep bouncing a flat basketball, well, I'm just asking the wrong question. Verse 6 continues with this thought. Now, brethren, if I come to you speaking in tongues, what will I profit you? Hmm. Still talking about you again. We're not talking about God, sorry. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking in tongues, what will I profit you unless I speak to you? either by way of revelation, or of knowledge, or of prophecy, or of teaching. Yet even lifeless things, either flute or harp, in producing a sound, if they do not produce a distinction in the tones, how will it be known what is played on the flute or on the harp? For if the bugle produces indistinct sound, who will prepare himself for battle? So also you, unless you utter by the tongue speech that is clear, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. There are perhaps a great many kinds of language in the world, and no kind is without meaning. If then I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be to the one who speaks a barbarian. And the one who speaks with, will be a barbarian to me. So also you, since you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. Interesting again, we're still talking about the assembly and the question has not even come up about God. We had a scripture reading today and that scripture reading mentions two things. It says, assemble because God commands it and God wants it and it's all about God, right? Did anybody hear that scripture reading? Because I couldn't find it in the Bible, so I just didn't actually do it. I found one that said we need to assemble you know who it mentioned, though? Us. That was confusing again. Because we've always been taught that we come to worship and we call it worship. Not edification time. I don't know. It'd be a good title for it, right? We come to edification time. It's not an unbiblical concept. It's not any worse than the word worship. 
Because if we say we come to worship, all we're saying is only thing that matters is that we're worshiping God. Mm, doesn't fit, does it? Because is the person speaking tongues worshiping God? Yes, he's speaking to God. He is being edified. His spirit is praising God. And Paul said, no, not good enough. He said prophecy. He said, because I would rather speak to you. He says, if an instrument does not make a clear sound, how do you know what to do? If someone plays the bugle, but they sound the retreat, how do you know to charge? If it's unclear, how do you know what to do? If someone calls you to assemble, but they play the note wrong and you disperse, then it doesn't matter. And that's what he says. <clears throat> if we do not edify one another, you're playing the notes wrong. You're, you're, you're telling everybody to retreat when we're trying to get them to charge. Verse 13, he tells us the outcome of all these things. Therefore, let one who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What is the outcome then? Finally, I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the mind also. I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the mind also. Otherwise, if you bless in the spirit only... How will the one who fills the place of the ungifted say thee, amen, at your giving of thanks, since he does not know what you are saying, for you are giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not edified. I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. However, in the church, I desire to speak five words with my mind so that I may instruct others also rather than ten words thousand I would rather speak five words with my mind so that I may instruct others also rather than 10,000 words in a tongue admit you you have to admit that it was exciting it had to be exciting to hear people speaking in tongues it had to be exciting for somebody to come up to you that you knew did not know a language and start speaking to you and it would have been great, and it would have edified one person. It would have built one person up. And if we're allowed to ask the question, it would change what we call worship. If we're allowed to ask the question that Paul asks in the Bible, when he's dealing with their worship and what's going on, and they're struggling between the greatness of prophecy and tongues. He doesn't say, well, they're both equal gifts, you know, just use them. Whenever you feel like it, you know, you use yours, take turns. He actually says, if there's no interpreter, don't even speak in tongues. Because nobody's edified. And so we come to edification today. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna, it sounds a little weird, doesn't it? I came to edification today. It's no less biblical. And everybody goes, you've taken the focus off of God. Well, Paul did it first. Because God doesn't intend for us to come to worship so we can do all the things and then be a flat basketball. He doesn't intend for us to do all these things so that we can do our rituals, do our rote mode, follow our traditions and do our stuff. He intends us for us to then be able to go do something. He intends for us to be able to take this outside and go play basketball. And if it's all about coming to God and worshiping him, and that's the only reason we come to church, then why doesn't the Bible say that? 
I've been taught it, I've been drilled it, and I hate it. Because the truth is we need one another. God doesn't give us one commandment and he says, there is one commandment that's greater than all the rest. Love God with all your whole soul, mind, and strength. And then he just snuck in that second one, didn't he? Jesus is sneaky. They say, what is the greatest commandment? That's one. What is the greatest? Not what are the two greatest? He's sneaky. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he said, there is a second like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And we come here today, and the question is, are we allowed to ask the question if we're building up each other? Is the person next to you? You can look at them. It's okay. We've already broken all the rules. I had y'all say yes in other words, like basketball. I get it. Only, you can only say amen. We read the verse. I get it. The truth is, we should be allowed to ask the question. We should be allowed to ask the question of, am I edifying my neighbor? And we may get different answers than if we just ask, is it a basketball? Are we doing everything in the correct order and is everything right there? Is it, is it wrong if the person next to you is hurting and you turn to them and love on them? I mean, that's out of order! And we do it. We do it. That's the worst part. We do that. We say, that's not what you're supposed to do. You stand still. You sit. To, stay in your square. Oh, you stepped out of your square. But if we ask a different question and we say, what is more edifying? It's looking at my neighbor who's hurting and there's some goofy dude up there talking or something. I don't really care. And but my neighbor right next to me is hurting and I know they're hurting. And I turn to them and ask them if they're okay. One of y'all are doing church right. One of y'all are considering how you can edify, how you can build up, how you can do consolation. Console, helping someone who's hurting. And if we came here and we actually asked the real questions, we would get all kinds of different answers. If I said, what do you need? How can I build you in such a way that God can then use you all week and then you'll come back and I'll help you again and you'll help me and we'll build each other up and we will build each other up until God uses us and we take over in the name of God. And the gates of hell will not prevail against us. Because we built each other up for that. Because we came together for the purpose of saying, I'm going to encourage you until you're ready to fight. Until you're ready to face the sin that's going to come at you this week. Until you're ready to deal with Satan in your life, I'm going to build you up. And I don't come here to just sing songs. I come here to sing songs to you. Have you ever noticed the command to sing is not towards God? What? Uh, no, I blew it up again. Teaching one another, singing to one another. Oh, worship is only this direction. No, it's not. I sing as much to you as I sing to God. When I say amazing grace, I'm telling you, there is amazing grace. I'm not telling God, God, there's amazing grace, in case you didn't figure it out. I'm telling you, there's amazing grace. I'm reminding you, there's amazing grace. You're singing to me. You're reminding me, there's amazing grace. Galatians 3. We see this all put together and working perfectly in what it looks like. Galatians 3, 26 through 29. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew, Greek, there is neither slave nor freedman. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus, and if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs, according to the promise. It's 
Today you are offered an opportunity, an invitation as it's traditionally called, but more so an opportunity. You're offered the opportunity to respond to God in such a way that he clothes you. He wraps himself around you and he builds you up. He takes away your sin. He makes you righteous. And in this, we're just asked to believe his words that he is Lord. Be willing to confess him as Lord. Be baptized into him. In a spirit of repentance that carries on throughout our life. If there's anybody who has not responded that, to that, or if anybody needs prayers, or if anybody wants to submit to the eldership here, we ask that you come now as we stand, as we sing.